technologies that are critical to the future of national defense. The EPI provides research and analyses to inform the development and integration of emerging technologies into the defense industrial base. So prior to this current position, many of you know Dr. Lewis was the Director of Defense Research and Engineering in the Department of Defense, where he oversaw technology modernization for all the services and DOD agencies. He was also the Acting Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. So when he was in that role, he was the Pentagon's senior most scientist. He managed a $17 billion budget that included agencies like DARPA, the Missile Defense Agency, the Defense Innovation Unit, Space Development Agency, the FFRDC, the Federally Funded Research and Development Centers, and the Department's Basic and Applied Research Portfolio. So he really was highly ranked here, which is one of the reasons we've invited him to be the pedals speaker here today. He's got a large number of awards and things, but I wanna make sure I give him a chance to talk. So if it's okay with Mark, I'll skip some of his the details here. Other than to say he was also one of us, he spent uh, 25 years at Maryland as a faculty member. So he's got government experience. He's worked for think tanks and support organizations. He's also served as in, in the DOD. He attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he got his bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics and earth and atmosphere, earth and planetary science. Sorry, I almost gave you our, our department's <laughs> name. Got his master's of science at MIT and his doctor of science at MIT and the MS and doctor are in aeronautics and astronautics. So with that, Mark, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. I will shut off my video and I'll be back when you finish up with, with your part of the lecture. So again, Great. thank you, Mark. It's really quite a privilege to be here. I, I'll start off by saying, I don't know of a university that so understands the intersection of technology and engineering and, and national defense as, as uh, quite quite like Purdue University. And and you know I, I'm a tremendous admirer of, of, of Purdue over the many years. I've had many friends and colleagues on the faculty. Um, I've had I've had many of our undergraduates from Maryland come to, to Purdue for graduate studies, and we've we brought many undergraduates from Purdue to Maryland for into our graduate programs. Um, so again, really really quite an honor to be able to address this audience and. And also, I see some 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 friends and colleagues from from the much broader Indiana engineering community. Um, when I was in the Pentagon, we we did some incredible work with with Indiana, uh, including industry, but as as well the the military installations such as uh, uh, the NSWC crane facility. So so thanks again. So what I want to talk about today is uh, emerging technologies for national defense, and and I want to give a kind of a broad overview of where I think we are, um, what the imperatives are. And then what are some of the challenges that we're facing in introducing modernizing technology for national defense? So let me see if I can advance. All right, so let me start off, uh, if I can, to being a little bit philosophical about, about the American way of war, right? how we fight wars. And it really comes down to a colleague in the Pentagon once said that really there are, there are two ways that you, there are two coins, if you will, involved in warfare. One is blood and the other is money. Blood is we fight wars, and unfortunately, we sometimes spend the lives of our, of our young men and women. The other is we can spend money to develop technologies. Uh, in most cases, the aim of that is to reduce the loss of life, both among our people and, and also uh, with our adversaries. So, so that is really very much um, our, the focus, why we, why we want the most advanced technology in our Department of Defense because we want to minimize the loss of life to our people and also to our opponents. Um, I, I will submit to you, I'm, I'm not a historian, but I spent a lot of time hanging out with historians. I recommend it, they always have the last word, so you always wanna have friends who are historians. But, but one of my historian friends likes to point out that that really um, our defense technology is, has always, always, always been a fundamental part of the way America has fought its wars. And this goes back to the, the origins of our nation, even before the origin of our nation. So, and during the Revolutionary War, there was a famous cry at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which really took place on Breed's Hill, but Battle of Bunker Hill, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. It was more than just a feel-good statement. It was an understanding of the importance of precision strike. You make every bullet count. You make your effects as precise as possible. I think it set us up for a history uh, within the, the United States military of, of emphasizing precision and, frankly, technology. Lots of examples of that through history. Um, the beginnings of the, the American Navy, um, when the United States finally decided it needed a Navy to fight the Barbary pirates, um, we began building a series of ships, including the early American frigates, that were a generation beyond anything else that was on the water. Right. So uh, today, if you go to Boston Harbor, you can view the USS Constitution. 
It's the oldest uh, floating commissioned uh, uh, warship uh, in the world. Um, when the Constitution was built, it was a generation beyond. It incorporated technologies that were far in advance of any other ship of its type on, on sailing the oceans. Um, look to the war to to the Civil War. Um, one of my favorite examples there was the introduction of ironclad ships. You notice, by the way, I'm an aerospace engineer, but I'm, I'm choosing some nautical examples from from the pre-aviation days. But you know, when when the uh, when the, the the Confederate Navy decided to cover one of its ships in iron, came uh, the the USS Merrimack became the 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 the, the Virginia. Um, that was an amazing revolution. Right? It was dispensing with sails and rope and 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 mass and focusing on propulsion, focusing on steam engine, and then focusing on uh, thick iron for defense. And of course, the, the the Union immediately responded with the ship that you see pictured in the upper right hand corner of your screen, the USS Monitor. Um, an amazing story there. That ship was built in a record 90 days. There were 65 separate patents on that ship. It changed the nature of warfare entirely. After the monitor was built, the United States uh, stopped building uh, mass and sailing ships. All right, it was it had completely changed the nature of war. Um, more recently, in the 1990s, we saw the introduction of stealth technology. Uh, for those those of us who remember the, uh, the 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 Gulf War, as the United States Air Force prosecuted its its uh, uh, first days over Baghdad. They unleashed this new technology, stealth technology, that made our aircraft essentially invisible on the radar. Um, the whole world took a took a step back, was gasping at the capabilities of this technology. Um, really, quite a revolution. And then, you know, since then, the introduction of precision munitions, um, uh, weapons that are guided precisely to their target, uh, again, has been a, a major revolution. And 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 I don't have to. And I don't think I even have to mention space. I'm, I'm sure you all recognize the importance of. Of a space as part of the American way of war. It's become our tremendous advantage. We use space for just about everything, communications, for sensing, um, where, where it's part of our, our defense network. The GPS system that we all rely upon on our iPhones, well, that was developed as part of the US military space infrastructure. So that's kind of the good news. We in the United States, we understand the importance of technology. We understand how to use technology and, and, and it's incorporated in our national defense posture. But there are also some other lessons that we need to take from history that kind of inform the, the, current, the, the current discussion. Right? We have missed a number of technological advances over the years. In the, in the center of the screen, I show a picture of a World War I airplane. That's a Newport 28. It was flown by America's foremost uh, uh, air ace of World War I, a gentleman named Eddie Rickenbacker. Rickenbacker was flying that Newport 28, which is, interestingly, not an American airplane. It's a French airplane. And that's because when the United States entered World War I, we had very few airplanes of our own. We essentially didn't have an aviation industry. We had to rely on other people's airplanes. It's a technology that we invented. We invented it by, you know, the Wright brothers uh, flew the first airplane in 1903. And by the time World War I broke out, we had essentially taken our foot off the gas. Now, lots of reasons why that happened. Not all technological, some was, some was political. Some is actually attributed directly to the Wright brothers, by the way. They, they, after they built their first airplanes, they, they basically sued anyone else who tried to build something similar. So they, they set the US industry back. But regardless, it's an example of a technology that we invented, we developed, we perfected, and then other people carried into, into the military. A lot of other examples of that, of that happening. Radar, for example, is one of them dropped. Oh, gas turbine engines. So the lower right-hand corner, um, I have a report that was written by the National Academy of Sciences in 1940 that concluded that the gas turbine engine could not be considered a feasible application for aircraft propulsion. They decided that the power to weight requirements uh, meant that a gas turbine engine would, no, no, would, would never be feasible for airplane propulsion. At the same time they wrote this report, Britain and Germany were first, to, first developing their, 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 their jet-powered aircraft. So we have dropped the ball. And, I also kind of like to smile about that. Um, one of the series of influential National Academy of Science reports, <laughs> not all of them good. And then finally, of course, rockets. Um, you know, Robert Goddard flew the first liquid fuel rockets uh, up in Massachusetts, but it was the Germans who once again uh, uh, introduced the rockets as, as a meaningful weapon of war. Now, we can debate how effective it was. Uh, the B-2 rocket was an amazing technological achievement with some limited uh, strategic effects. But, but still, it shows that once again, we, we have had this propensity for, for, 
for dropping the ball fuel well taking our foot off the gas um the bottom line is that, you know defense technology it's always moving quickly it's always advanced so just because you have an advantage today doesn't mean you'll have an advantage tomorrow and that means we are constantly in a race we're constantly we're constantly looking over our shoulders as we develop technology and if we skip a beat if we don't continue to press and pursue we can very quickly find ourselves um, uh, 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 lagging behind. All right, so let me now call your attention to a defining document that those of us in the Pentagon cited quite often. This is the National Defense Strategy that was released, released in 2018. Every four years, the Department of Defense releases this major document known as the National Defense Strategy. Um, it includes the work of many, many folks working across the national defense infrastructure. It's authored in the Pentagon, but it draws from across the government. It's input from industry think tanks. Um, and 2018 was a landmark year for a national defense strategy. Let me first point out that, as, as I said, the national defense strategy is a four year exercise. So the 2018 national defense strategy was begun in 20, well, actually, uh, uh, as early as 2014. And really started coming in, you know, was, was really most of the, the work assembling it was in the 2016 2017 timeframe. So it transcended administrations. It wasn't a product of a single administration. And the defense secretary who advocated for this, who, who basically owned this strategy, who signed the cover page when it was released, was uh, Secretary Mattis, who, who was very much seen as a bipartisan, bipartisan leader. And this strategy had a couple of key elements. First and foremost, Many of us would argue is the first national defense strategy in quite some time that was truly a strategy, right? Most previous national defense strategies, very candidly, had been more tactical. They'd been more reactive. This was the, was the first strategy in quite some time that planted some real strategic flags. And I want to quote a couple of lines from this strategy because it, it's quite significant. All right, first, uh, early on in the strategy, it states that we're emerging, we in the United States are emerging from a period of strategic atrophy, aware that our competitive military advantage has been eroding. In other words, other people have been investing and they're catching up to us. The incredible advantage that we had is starting to slip away. Now, I'll cite back to that release of stealth technology during the Gulf War. Well, that was 30 years ago now and more. The whole world has had an opportunity to study what we did, how we did it, the technologies that we employed, ways that you might counter that technology, that advantage is already slipping, is already slipping away. Second, the National Defense Strategy also named names. It called people out, right? It listed China as a strategic competitor that's investing heavily, using what, what the report calls predatory economics, uh, uh, investing, you know, building up its military um, across the South China Sea and beyond. It also called out Russia for bad behavior, violating borders of its nearby nations, but also continuing to invest, building on you know, it's Cold War legacy of technology, but all using all the levers of power. Now, this strategy cited other countries. North Korea gets a, a shout out. Iran gets a shout out. But the key feature is that this that this, that this, this document made was that while other nations obviously pose a threat to the United States, it was China and Russia that were true strategic competitors. And that was the existential threat that the United States needed to address. Um, very candidly in the Pentagon, by the time I arrived back in, in 2019, we used to say all China all the time. That's the country we were focused on as investing heavily in trying to catch up to us. Now at the same time, the national defense strategy wasn't naive about other threats, right? Pointed out that the homeland, the United States, is no longer a sanctuary. We, through most of our history, could rely on the fact that we were separated from the rest of the world by two large oceans. We had friendly neighbors in the north, friendly neighbor on the south. So really in a, in a blessed situation, Compare that to to Europe, where where friends and enemies are in close proximity to each other. Really, quite a quite an advantageous geographic location. And now, of course, in the modern era, that geographic advantage is, is no longer so pronounced. Um, it also points out that in order to meet these these uh, threats, well, we need to modernize key capabilities. But the court explicitly says we cannot expect success if we fight tomorrow's conflicts with yesterday's weapons, right? A very important message, again, echoing that theme that technology is constantly advancing. And, and then dear, near, near and dear to the hearts of those of us who spent our careers looking at the intersection of technology and, and defense, 
The report explicitly says we anticipate the implications of new technologies on the battlefield, rigorously define the military problems anticipated in future conflict, and foster a culture of experimentation and calculated risk taking. And that echoes in the number of us have been saying over many years that we need to be willing to take risks. We need to be willing to accept risks. We need to be willing to fail as we develop the technologies that will be part of our, our, our future Department of Defense. All right, so if you go through that National Defense Strategy document in more detail, um, and with its emphasis on the importance of technology, a number of technology areas immediately jump out. They're cited, uh, they're, they're referenced, and, and I've got those technology areas listed here in this slide. Um, and, and I put them in, in, in several specific categories. And, and by way of explanation, I will tell you that, again, when I, when I showed up in the Pentagon in, in November of 2019, um, as Bill mentioned, as the Director of Defense Research and Engineering, I was basically handed this list, right? My, my boss at the time, the Under Secretary of Defense, uh, handed me this list and said, this is what you need to focus on. These are the modernization priorities from the National Defense Strategy. Now, I will tell you, it's not a list that I came up with. But if I were to come up with my own list, this is pretty much the list I would have come up with. Right? I, I, I dare say that if I asked almost anyone in this, in, in this audience to come up with a list of technologies that they think are vital to national defense, well, I think you'd come up with a, a pretty comparable list. Right? These are the things that we know today are, are important, not only for the nation as a whole, but specifically for the defense sector. And I tend to put them in, 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 in three uh, specific categories. First, Underlying capabilities. Those are the capabilities that are kind of at the core of what we do in defense. Right? They could be components. It could be uh, uh, it could be functionalities. Um, first is microelectronics. Absolutely key. Right? Microelectronics is at the heart of pretty much everything we do in the department. Well, it's at the heart of almost everything we do in modern life. You know, I. I I, I joke that short of buying a hammer at Home Depot, almost anything you buy today has some microelectronic component to it. Um, I will tell you right now, we're in a very serious situation in microelectronics. We face some significant challenges there, and I'll elaborate on those in a moment. Um, autonomy, artificial intelligence, cyber, three different areas, but obviously overlapping, right? Autonomy, I think of is as the use of, of, of machine systems in place of human beings, or right? any unmanned airplane, any any uncrewed watercraft, uh, any robotic system, um, we've all seen the tremendous advances in in unmanned aircraft, for example, UAVs, drones, as they're called popularly, um, and the way they they become integral to the battlefield. Um, it's often been said that the military has been dragged kicking and screaming into the, into the adoption of, of autonomous system, unmanned systems. I'm here to tell you that's actually not true. That, that, that's absolutely, un, uh, absolutely, absolutely the opposite is, is the case. The military has really stepped up to the plate in, in adopting autonomous systems and unmanned systems. It's, it's becoming more increasingly uh, part of the American way of war. Artificial intelligence, right? Really important area. Obviously, artificial intelligence is infusing almost everything we do in technology. I can think of very, very few more important applications in, 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 in the defense sector. And then cyber, and especially cyber defense. Uh, re referencing those comments in the na National Defense Strategy that, that pointed out that the homeland is is no longer secure, and one of the reasons is cyber. People people can now use cyber to reach us um, 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 uh, as easily as they can their next door neighbors. And then point that all together: fully FNCQ, that stands for Fully Network Command Control Communication. We've come to understand that the battlefield of the future is a fully networked battlefield. It's a battlefield where sensors are interacting with each other where sensors are connecting to different, different weapon systems, where operators have a site picture that greatly enhances their effectiveness. Now, as will probably not surprise anyone in this audience, we haven't done a particularly good job in, in this area, so up to now. Um, we tend to have siloed systems. We have services that don't always talk well to each other. We have systems that don't, uh, often communicate with, well with each other. You know, whole aircraft systems don't communicate well with other whole aircraft systems. Sometimes by design, so breaking those those stovepipes, using those sensors for combined advantage is 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 going to be key to success in the future battle. That's category one. Second category, I kind of put in the broad area of delivered effects. That's hardware, things that I can hold in my hand or things that I can see deliver you know specific weapons. And, and there there are, there are a couple that we we focus on. Um, 
space obviously one all right space is already as i mentioned earlier integral to the way we communicate the way we sense the way we interact with our systems the way we navigate all right absolutely critical to the american way of war um, in 2008 as i was winding down my time as the chief scientist of the air force um, i kicked off a study that became known as the day without space study we asked the question what would happen in the u.s military if we were suddenly deprived of all of our space capabilities. Now, that's a bit of a far-fetched scenario, all right? No one's gonna be able to deprive us all at once. However, we do realize that our space capabilities are ever more at risk. Other people have realized how much we rely on them, and they've come up with ways to neutralize those capabilities. The Day Without, the day without Space uh, study came to a very straightforward conclusion. Um, we would have a very hard time fighting a war if we didn't have our space assets. It was fascinating because you know, we talked to people in the military and say, what would you do without space? They say, oh, we don't need space. We have the, all these backup systems. And then you start diving in and you say, okay, how do we use those backup systems? Well, those backup systems ultimately at some point depend on space. So quite, quite, a, quite a vulnerability. Previous Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson, um, made, made the observation that we built a lot of our space systems um, like a glass house, and we never took into account the fact that the neighbors could throw stones at us. So that's the situation that we're in today. Direct energy, that includes lasers, microwaves, high-powered systems. Um, this is an area that, that, that the joke is that, that direct energy is, is the future, and it always will be, except we're, we're at the point now where we're seeing breakthroughs in direct energy. We're seeing lasers reaching power levels and suddenly they become viable weapons, viable uh, 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 systems. We've also begun to understand that directed energy wouldn't just replace kinetic systems, right? You, you don't simply replace a gun with a laser. Instead, you use a laser or a microwave system in ways that you couldn't use the gun. You know, one obvious example is a, a laser gives you an almost infinite magazine. And with a gun, I can run out of bullets. With a laser, as long as I've got electric power, I can keep on going. So if I'm defending, say, against an attack of swarming weapons, lasers can be very attractive. Lasers also can, can, can factor into a cost curve. All right? right now, if I'm being attacked with a relatively low-cost UAV, um, one of my weapons of choice might be a much more expensive missile. You don't want to shoot down a $1,000 drone with a million-dollar missile. That doesn't, that doesn't factor well into the cost curve. If I can shoot down that $1,000 drone, with a laser that cost me five cents worth of electricity, that's a really good cost exchange. So that's another reason direct energy is very important for, for the future battle. And then my own personal favorite, hypersonics, right? That's high speed, high speed systems, systems that operate in excess of about five times the speed of sound. Um, hypersonics is more than just speed, though. It's a combination of speed and maneuverability operating in, on trajectories and in realms where um, where, where uh, uh, basically uh, uh, it makes them extra extraordinarily survivable, right? And um, um, and and really has has a, can have a profound impact on the battlefield of the future. Uh, I will tell you that when we did war fighting exercises in the Pentagon, in some of our scenarios, if we didn't have hypersonic systems available, we the United States didn't win because we knew our adversaries were investing very heavily in this area. And then. Third category, sort of the category of future promise. Right? These are areas where we know there will be significant, significant uh, uh, future engagement, right? That's the area of uh, quantum science, biotechnology. Um, and, and um, you know, we're not in many cases sure exactly what those mean for the, for the future battlefield, but we, we know that they're important and we know that they have significant, significant uh, promise for the way we, 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 uh, the way we operate. Quantum, for example, holds the potential of giving us substantially, substantially improved sensors, uh, replacements for some space assets for precision navi uh, navigation timing. Biotechnology can change the way we manufacture things. Um, whole new avenues for producing jet fuels or structural materials or producing new materials. So again, really promising technology. All right, let me move to our next, which is among those, which are the ones that we're most concerned about? And let me suggest to you that there are a number of technologies, right? Um, 
of those 11 topic areas, if you count them, there were 11. Um, you know, there were immediately emerged. Right? Hypersonics, as I mentioned, really important one. Because if we don't have it in the future, we won't win. Lots of technology issues associated with hypersonics. What's the right propulsion system? How do we use these systems? How do we deliver them at scale? It's fine to do a prototype. I can build a hypersonic you know, weapon, fly at once, high five, and, and congratulate myself, myself for an engineering accomplishment. What we really want to do is be able to deliver hypersonic systems at scales can have, that can have significant impact on the future battlefield. Frankly, there have been some recent studies looking at hypersonic weapons in the role of the battlefield that have been quite bad. All right? they've, they've missed some important points and some more important elements on, on what hypersonics can mean for the, for, for the future of combat. And so we're at kind of a turning point where we're investing. We've got solid roadmaps. We need to be continuing to advance the case for this technology. Microelectronics, another really important one. When I was in the Pentagon, I said it was my number one priority. And that's because we have gotten ourselves into what are described as a bit of a pickle. We are reliant on foreign sources today for our state-of-the-art microelectronics. If you wish to buy a, a state-of-the-art component, microelectronic component, you're almost certainly buying it from a foreign manufacturer. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation uh, is, 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 is one of the largest manufacturers, for example, of our, our semiconductor components. So big push for how do we onshore microelectronics? How do we bring that industry back to the United States? More importantly, the Department of Defense right now is incapable of buying state-of-the-art microelectronics. We're not on what is called the commercial curve, right? That's because of decisions that were made, policy decisions that were made, investment decisions that were made, that essentially today precludes us from buying state-of-the-art. So if you pick up a Department of Defense system today, if you pick up a uh, any component that uses microelectronics in the DoD, you will find that it is using microelectronics that could be a generation behind or two generations behind. That's bad from several standpoints. One, it leads to obsolescence very quickly, right? People stop manufacturing parts and you got a problem. You don't know where to get those future parts. So if you find out that someone's gonna stop manufacturing the component, you need to do a big investment on a legacy buy which means you're, tra you're buying lots of parts, you're putting a lot of money into a purchase for something that's about to become obsolete. Then of course, there are some DOD unique needs in microelectronics. Um, in the DOD, we need things that are radi radiation hard, right? things that can survive in a, in a very harsh radiation environment. And uh, we're, we're the only ones who really need that. There are some space applications for radiation hard as well. That's an area the DOD needs to really focus on. Directed energy, right? I mentioned the importance of directed energy and what that could mean for the future battlefield. Um, that's still very much an area that requires um, significant risk, risk taking, right? It's an area that um, that uh, the services have really been a bit slow to incorporate, that they're not placing bets in what happens if all those demonstrations and laboratory experiments actually work. And so there are some programmatic challenges. There are also some technical challenges. It's not enough to have a really good laser. You have to have a way to steer it and point it and control the beam quality. And then, of course, we need an industrial base that can produce the, 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 the systems that, that ultimately will be fielded. And that's an industrial base that includes not only prime manufacturers, but also uh, um, um, uh, uh, elements right down the supply chain, including the use of some rare earth elements that are integral to the design and manufacture of, of lasers. And then finally, Another key area, biotechnology. I mentioned the importance of biotechnology. It's got an important role in the industrial base. Um, it can play a key role in, in manufacturing new ways of manufacturing. Um, something that I discovered when I when I when I came back to the Pentagon in 2019, when I would talk to people about biotechnology, I would often be faced with a response from the services along the lines of, "Yeah, that's really important, but it's not what we do. We don't. We're not a biotechnology service. You know, the U.S. Army would say we don't do biotechnology." The Air Force would say, we don't do biotechnology. The Navy would say, we don't do biotechnology. Then the pandemic hit. And everyone realized the importance of investments in biotechnology. Um, I think one of the good news stories that's gonna emerge from, from, from this pandemic was that a lot of the work that went into developing those COVID-19 vaccines can be traced back to investments that were made by the Department of Defense. DARPA played a very big role in the initial investments in development of messenger RNA uh, vaccines. 
um, in, in, in many cases because DARPA was willing to take risks that other organizations weren't. So I think that was an eye-opening experience, it really changed the, the nature of the conversation sur or surrounding uh, biotechnology. All right, next. So a little bit of uh, shameless self-promotion here. Um, as as uh, uh, Bill mentioned at the beginning of the, my, my talk, um, I'm now at the Emerging Technologies Institute. We're a brand new technology institute that's really focused on these emerging technologies. So we set this up, it's, we're, we're all of about a month into establishing this institute, but as a nonpartisan institute, focused on that list of technologies, those critical modernization technologies, will be a part of national defense. Um, research and analysis will be part of what we're doing, um, engaging with national leaders, informing uh, uh, not only government, but also in industry partners, and relying on the vast resources of uh, National Defense Industrial uh, uh, Association, uh, not only the governance structure, but members and companies, all that help us um, provide the information, the reports, the analysis, have the conversations that we think are going to be important in this whole issue of national defense and technology. All right, so let me, let me finish up by talking about, I've talked, I've, I've talked about the importance of emerging technologies. Um, I've talked to you about the, the, the area Right, I've talked about why each of those areas, each of those individual areas is important. Let me focus now a little bit on what are the challenges that we face, and there are many, right? First, acquisition. It's not enough just to research, develop, and engineer the system. In order to be useful for national defense, you have to get it into the hands of the combatants. Sometimes in the Pentagon, we refer to it as the pointy end of the spear means you need to acquire it. It means you need to have someone who, who purchase it, purchases that technology, who maintains it, who sustains it, who trains personnel with that technology. We know those timelines can be really long. Our frontline uh, fighters, the F-22 and the F-35, have taken more than two decades to go from concept to deployment. The F-35 is still in the process of being deployed, right? Other systems we've seen take very long time. Well, unfortunately, we no longer have that luxury. But countries like China, they're breathing down our neck, investing you know, very, very quickly. Um, we've seen them be uh, able to acquire new technologies, acquire new systems, frankly, at a pace that, that, that puts ours to shame. So trying to trim down those acquisition timelines, that's a big challenge. A lot of effort going under, underway right now within the department, creating organizations uh, such as DIU and AFWorks, Space Development Agency, all of which are really designed to shrink those acquisition timelines, to take lessons learned from industry, and introduce those into the defense ecosystem. Another part of that is what's called the acquisition valley of death. That's a term you hear very commonly in defense S&T circles. What does that refer to? Well, that valley of death is that wide gap that we often encounter between the development of a technology and its incorporation. Lots of people have talked about why there is a valley of death. I, I argue it isn't really a valley of death, it's a mountain of death, and that there's a tremendous amount of money that's available within the department to go from the laboratory to prototype. The trick is to convince people to accept that prototype and incorporate it into their system. And why is that such a challenge? Well, the next bullet points that out. Within the department, we've got a lot of legacy systems, often systems we have invested in, in, in into which we've invested a lot of money. Right? Um, uh, aircraft carriers are incredibly expensive. You don't build an aircraft carrier this week and decide next week you're no longer going to be using it. Right? Once you've made that investment, yes, stick with it. Right? A new airplane is a very expensive investment. Space systems are expensive investments. It's not only the initial investment, but it's the training, it's the backup, it's the supplies, it's all the everything that goes into sustainment. So whenever you incorporate a new technology, you have to convince someone frankly give up something something older or right. give up a legacy capability and lots of people get a vote in that so i've got a picture in the middle of the screen of an airplane called the a10 given the the the, the rather unflattering unflattering name the warthog because some people consider it an ugly airplane uh, though others of us would argue that that part of its ugliness is in its beauty the warthog was designed as a close air combat support airplane this is a tank killer this is an airplane operated by the U.S. Air Force to fly low and slow and protect our, protect our troops. It's an old airplane. The company that built this airplane is no longer in business. Um, 
the Air Force has trying, been trying to decommission this airplane because they, it, it has argued it has newer systems that can do the same mission. But yet Congress has not allowed the Air Force to do that because they've argued that the newer systems are not as capable and not as readily available as this, this unique airplane. And so even when you want to decommission a system, you don't, you aren't always allowed to do that. Other challenge, industrial base vulnerabilities. I've mentioned this throughout my talk, all right? Um, what is the industrial base? It's the total lineup of companies that are involved in supplying the national defense infrastructure with various, various technologies, various capabilities. Um, the COVID pandemic brought this message home that we have points in our industrial base that truly are vulnerable, right? Individual suppliers, individual companies, which if they're no longer able to function, will put at risk other pieces of national defense. We saw that, for example, in the aerospace industry. As the commercial sector stopped buying airplanes, that had rippling implications to aircraft propulsion. And the Department of Defense buys engines from the same people that build engines for the commercial sector. Right? We even saw it in such things, mundane uh, 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 things as uniforms. So the Department of Defense is required to buy its uniforms from American suppliers. That includes American sources, American manufacturers, sources of American uh, uh, material. Um, we found that as a pandemic, pandemic kicked in, the people who make the uniforms, the Department of Defense, weren't well equipped to operate through the pandemic. When you think about how you how you uh, sew together uniforms, you got people sitting on top of each other, hovered, hovered over sewing machines, and those companies started cutting down. And the Department was afraid that it wouldn't be able to have continue buying uniforms and have enough uniforms for its soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen. So now think about you know, other parts of the, the industrial base and, and what that may, might mean, especially in the higher technology areas. So again, vulnerabilities to the industrial base, really key issue. Another challenge we've got, test and evaluation, right? This is always a controversy. How much money do you put into test and evaluation versus how much money do you put in actually building the thing and fueling? Um, as a guy who grew up on wind tunnels, I'll be the first to tell you that you know wind tunnel wind tunnels are absolutely a critical tool in aerospace engineering. If you want to buy down the risk of anything that you're ultimately going to fly. Now there are, uh, there's an, uh, some school of thought that says, hey, as we develop modeling and simulation, as it's become more and more a tool of the trade. There's less and less need for wind tunnels. I, I have not to buy that. I think modeling and simulation goes hand in hand with the role of the wind tunnel. I think it changes the way we use the wind tunnel, but doesn't eliminate the need for the wind tunnel. But that's certainly a tension, you know, a tension that you see. Do we put more money in building up those test capabilities or do we invest that those dollars in the actual system? And and I can tell you, I, I've been on a number of recent uh, 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 committees. I was on some review boards. For things that fail, often held in spectacularly expensive ways, at the end of the day, it came down to they failed because there wasn't enough test, there wasn't enough, enough evaluation done before these systems were fielded. Workforce, another big challenge. Um, how do we make sure that the best and the brightest are working on the problems that are of critical importance to national defense? All right, that's at the undergraduate level, at the master's level, at the PhD level. How do we make sure that the smartest minds are working in our in the Air Force Research Lab, in the Army Research Lab, in the Naval Research Lab, at university labs that are supporting the work of the national defense? We're working in the industry. But it goes even beyond that, right? We need a skilled technical workforce. You know, the, the pipe fitters, the plumbers, even, even in, 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 in uh, such sectors as test and evaluation. You know, it takes a certain skill set to put a, a gauge on a wind tunnel model. It takes a certain degree of training to be able to build a model, to be able to instrument it properly. And that workforce is at risk and something that we were putting a lot of, paying a lot of attention to in the Department of Defense. Um, you know, um, I, I will tell you that we saw our peer competitors focusing on that issue as well, making sure that their universities were incorporated with the work of their industry, industry and work of their government. And, and we were ramping that up uh, uh, quite a bit in response. And finally, there's the issue of bad ideas, right? And, 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 and I highlight that because there's a certain school of thought that says, all right, let's just keep dumping money at any problem, right? If we've 
if we've got a if we've got a technology issue, we'll just spend more money. We'll invest more. We'll invest more in technology X, right? Space is vulnerable. Just put a lot of more money into space. Hypersonics just dump a lot more money into hypersonics. Turns out that's not the best approach, right? You can waste a lot of money doing that. You have to filter out the bad ideas from the good ideas. You have to figure out how do I make those investment decisions that I'm getting the best bang for my taxpayer dollars. Best way to know how to do that is with a skilled workforce. So see the bullet point above that we need to have the best and the brightest people making these decisions in order that we can stay at the forefront. And I will tell you, as, as someone who's who's worked on, you know, worked in, in, in academia, worked in government, sometimes the most valuable skill set that we bring is the ability to see past a bad idea, to recognize a truly good idea from something that just flat out won't work. And then the last point, which is, how do we pursue these emerging technologies? How do we resp respond to these threats? And especially, how do we respond to these threats without doing more harm to ourselves than good? So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll cite a, an example, perhaps my least favorite example, example out of the aerospace industry. So some decades back, there were some significant concerns being raised about other countries infiltrating and, and frankly exfiltrating uh, information from our industrial base. And a series of rules and laws were put into place that are collectively known as ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations. And ITAR put significant restrictions on our ability to share technology with foreign partners. Now, ITAR is not classified, right? A technology on the ITAR list isn't necessarily on the classified list. It doesn't have to be secret, top secret, but it, be, be in a, it can be in a category of technology such that we will not discuss it, share it, or more importantly, sell it to another nation. When ITAR rules kicked in, they had a, initially, they had a, a, a positive effect, right? They prevented some of our adversaries from getting a hold of technologies that we didn't want them to have. In the long run, many of us would argue it had a negative effect because those other nations are sponsored by building their own indigenous capabilities, right? Whole industries were created overseas. Um, China especially responded by stepping up to the plate in, in key technology areas, especially in space. And then by the way, using that as a leverage arm to partner with nations that we would not partner with. We face that today. We have some folks who looked at some of the threats that we face and they've said things like, you know, close the gates. Right? If we're worried about peer competitors uh, uh, stealing from us, then let's keep their researchers from coming to the United States. Let's keep their students from coming to the United States. And I would argue adamantly that that's the wrong, the wrong thing to do because if we do that, we wind up hurting ourselves more than anyone else. Right? If we close our gates to the best and the brightest from around the world, then ultimately we don't get that infusion of talent. We don't get that, that, that incredible uh, um, um, skill set coming to the United States, participating in our community, contributing to our ideas, and ultimately helping our own industrial base. And some of us have even advocated that, that every PhD uh, diploma that, that, is, that is awarded to, to uh, uh, a non-US citizen should come with a green card stapled to it, to encourage, and, and encourage uh, uh, those individuals to stay in the United States, um, and, 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 and really to, to contribute to 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 um, our, our our amazing uh, s and enterprise um I'll, I'll i'll leave with that note and and i'll i'll close out with that note of, of optimism which is that you know how, how do i think we're doing how do i how do i how do i view our our, our relative success in, in emerging technologies first I, I think we're doing quite well um the department of defense has stepped up to the plate um the creation of the undersecretary of defense for research and engineering was in fact a major, uh, uh, was a milestone in addressing those emerging technologies. The whole office in the Pentagon focused on emerging technologies. Uh, second, we were very successful in creating a series of roadmaps, getting the services working together, getting the agencies working together, all on these, these uh, uh, emerging technologies. Um, one of the last things that I did in the Pentagon was kind of a report card on how, how the Department of Defense was doing. And it was a very promising report card indeed. And we had a lot, to, we had a lot left to do. We had a, a you know, we, we were making progress, but we were, weren't there yet. But across the board, we saw the department taking these technologies very, very seriously. Um, I think we also saw a recognition of the great strengths that we have in our system. Right? We have many inefficiencies. 
country like China can can move more quickly than we can. Um, uh, dictatorships can be very, very efficient. They don't have to abide by acquisition rules. They don't have long timelines. They they aren't burdened, if you will, with 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 this focus on fairness and equal opportunity. They can make unilateral decisions, and it allows them to move very quickly. But what they don't have, they don't have the diversity of of a scientific enterprise, a diversity of ideas, a diversity of sources, a diversity of diversity of opportunities. They don't have allies and partners, you know, countries who bring new perspectives, different research uh, focus areas, who will team with us, who will teach us new ideas. Um, they don't have that at their beck and call, and, and we do. And I think that's the essential strength of our system and why ultimately I think um, we're, we are, although we have to be mindful of our threats, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're in a race, I think at the, at the end of the day, we're actually very well positioned to meet these challenges that we are facing. So that, let me thank everyone for your attention. Um, I, if there are any questions that you have, I'd be delighted to, uh, to answer what, 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 whatever, is, whatever is on your mind. Hey, great, thank you, Mark. Really, really appreciate the, uh, the discussion. So we're gonna do something special for the, for the questions and answers. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Stefascia. He's gonna moderate the question and answer session with Dr. Lewis. And as many have already been doing in the audience, you can type in questions in the Q and A window. If you're on the WebEx, there should be a chat window and there should be a Q and A window. We, we prefer you use the Q and A window. You can type in a question and Josh will ask Dr. Lewis. And so it'll kind of look like a discussion between Josh and Mark, but that'll be a way for the audience to be able to ask questions. Quick Great. reminder to everybody, all of the discussion today is approved for public release. And so it needs to stay in that domain. So it's entirely possible that Mark will have to say, I can't answer that question. Yeah. Just heads up for everybody. Yeah. Uh, let me introduce Josh real quick. Josh is one of several active military, uh, do active duty military officers here at Purdue, participating in something we call the Purdue Military Research Initiative. So this is a program that provides no cost graduate education to these active duty officers. We have eight of these students right now in aeronautics and astronautics. There's a little more than 20, I believe, at Purdue in all kinds of different departments across campus, and they range from near the end of their PhD studies, like Josh is to several second lieutenants just getting started with us. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Stefascia is a active duty UASF test pilot. He graduated from the test pilot school. He's been assigned to Purdue as, his, as the PhD student is his assignment currently. He has a BS in physics and math from the Air Force Academy. He's got a master of science in aerospace engineering from the University of Alabama and an MS in flight test engineering from the Air University. He's logged 2200 hours flying in 32 different military aircraft and 521 combat hours. And so after he gets done here, he's going to go back and be an instructor pilot for the USF Tusk School. So with that, let me turn things over to Josh. So Josh, why don't you take over from here? All right, thank you, sir. Uh, like uh, Dr. Crosby just, just mentioned, my name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Josh Trafascia. And um, first, I just want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Lewis for, um, uh, I would say, a very relevant uh, topic to come out and talk to us about. Um, and. Uh, and uh, also thank you to the panel for uh, for including me to uh, to be part of the uh, the question and answer session. Um, real quick, uh, we have a reminder of the uh, this is an unsecure uh, venue, so I won't go over that again. Just make sure we don't get in trouble. Um, keep it in the public domain uh, and uh, or in the uh, the unclass domain. And we won't have any issues. Um, first off, uh, we're we're still having some questions come in. So uh, while those are coming in, I'm going to ask one uh, kind of selfish question uh, as a, a DT test pilot. Yeah, um, I, uh, I I'm curious. <clears throat> you mentioned some of the issues just with the acquisition time timelines uh, being so drawn out. Uh, in your opinion, do you see any any opportunities? Um, you know, especially me going back and uh, and starting to to work with with test pilot school again. Any uh, low hanging fruit or easy opportunities to compress the acquisition timeline? Um, you know, in, in, in any of the stages uh, to do it both safely so that we're not you know, missing things in the, the, the test and, and evaluation, um, but getting these technologies uh, to the point where we're caught up again and, and, and pushing forward and getting ahead uh, in something like, like hypersonics. So, so I love that question. So, so I would argue that the limitations are more cultural than anything else, right? Every time someone asks me, hey, does the department need new authorities so that can acquire, you know, speed up acquisition timelines? No, we've actually got all the authorities that we need, just a matter of using them. Now, the good news is we've seen some clear examples of, of, of how to do that. Um, I mentioned the Space Development Agency. So that was an organization that we stood up specifically to acquire space systems 
in an incredibly short period of time. And they did it, all right? The Space Development Agency, for example, they're doing a, a series of, of, of space systems that are all focused on building survivable space platforms, what we call proliferated LEO constellations, lots of small satellites in low Earth orbit. They went from an industry day in spring to contract award in late summer just by moving quickly because that's their mantra, all right? Hypersonics, you've got, you've got a good example there. I mean, that's one where, that's a very frustrating story because that's a field of, that the United States invented. I mean, we, we developed it, we created it, and now we're playing a catch-up game. In part, I would argue that's because of our own mindsets. We were, we were kind of doing a leisurely pace, right? We're taking our own sweet time. We would test once and it worked, and we test the next again, maybe a year later, and then we do another flight test. We need to be testing early and often. We've seen the examples how to do this. I, I, I often cite the X-15 rocket plane program that was flown out of Edwards Air Force Base in the 1960s. Right? That's a program that did 199 test flights. They were flying on average once every 18 days. So we've seen how to do this. It's a matter of having the right mindset, and it's more cultural than anything else. So the more that one, you know, when uh, Lieutenant Colonel, when you when you when you when you when you're back and act when you're when you're back full time, the more you can pound your fist on the table and, and on the desk and say, "Do it faster, do it more quickly," the 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 better you'll be advancing us. All right, perfect. That's that's what I like to hear. Um, <clears throat> Uh, real quick, uh, one of the questions that came through, kind of a uh, an easy one. Uh, what what's a typical day like for you? What are your your uh, responsibilities, tasks uh, that you know maybe in your current job, uh, which I know yeah. you've only been there a short period of time, but then also your previous job. So you know, I would argue that in in, in each of my previous jobs and my current job, I've never had a typical day. <laughs> There's no such thing as a typical day. So my current job, we're setting up a whole new institute. I'm, I'm working with you know colleagues here at the National Defense Industrial Association. Uh, an incredible team here, uh, partners in industry, partners in government, uh, partners in academia. Um, the Pentagon, I mean, I mean, the Pentagon, okay, so I will tell you, there, there are some people in the, in the military who design their careers to avoid spending time in the Pentagon. I thought that was insane. I loved every second that I was in the Pentagon. It's, it's Imperial Rome. It's where all decisions are being made. When you're in the Pentagon, right when you're on the E-ring, you, you never know what any day is going to be like. Oh, uh, you know, on a Monday, you could be sitting across the table from the Secretary of Defense providing him advice on uh, hypersonic weapons. On Tuesday, you could be sitting with the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy discussing, you know, the role of technology in international engagement. You know, on Wednesday, you could be getting an intelligence brief that's going to scare the crap out of you, informing you what our adversaries are doing in a given area, and on and on and on. It's really, it's a really exciting venue. Very cool. Uh yeah, I'm, I might be one of those people that's been uh, avoiding trying to get out there. No, 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 don't do that. We need people like you. <laughs> uh, real quick, um, kind of a follow up to the, to the previous question. Uh, one of the the considerations that always gets talked to us in the uh, in the uh, developmental test world is um, uh, making sure that when we're we're getting all these new technologies. Uh, making sure that that while we're focused on the emerging technology itself, that we're also developing the infrastructure required in order to test them. Um, and and you were mentioning that you know at least in some recent examples that you've seen where we've we've either missed things or not tested enough. And so I'm curious if you've seen over the past couple of years that uh, we've been making the appropriate investments in in uh, test and evaluation infrastructure, whether it's ranges, you know, targets, upgraded telemetry type things. Um, you know, those kind of investments so that when when we do get that new technology, well, we don't go, oh, well, in order to test this thing, we need A, B, and C, and then we're waiting and, and delaying that timeline for, you know, potentially months to, to get the infrastructure in place to test it. So the simple answer is no, we don't have an adequate test infrastructure. And you're right, we're not, we, we've made some investments. So in the department, there's a test resource management center that actually used to report to me. Um, in, in my previous job, and, and they have oversight over all the DOD uh, test and evaluation facilities. But the simple answer is no, we don't have adequate facilities. We have good facilities, but 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 in many cases uh, they're 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 too few and far between. I'll give you one perfect example. So you mentioned hypersonics. Um, we don't have enough hypersonic ground test facilities in the nation yet. Um, there are key areas of the uh, key aspects of the hypersonic flight envelope that we have difficulty simulating on the ground. The facilities that can simulate them. Can't meet the need of the various programs that we want to field. Um, hypersonic propulsion, perfect example. Um, if you want to test a, a an air breathing hypersonic engine, what we call a supersonic combustion ramjet today, 
you basically got two choices. You're going to the NASA Langley 8 foot tunnel, you're going to the Arnold Engineering uh, Development Center AP2 facility. Um, at one point last year, the AP2 facility was down, was down for maintenance. We forgot to turn a valve on a cooling system. And the Langley facility was almost at risk because it had a, a nozzle that was beyond its uh, uh, lifespan. So we almost lost all of our capability to do so. Um, other things that, you know, uh, 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 right now we're talking about uh, reusable hypersonic technologies, reusable hypersonic systems. We don't have a really good way to test a propulsion plant for such a hypersonic vehicle. And so having that infrastructure, I think, is absolutely critical. And then there are other elements to it. So, so we saw in the test range. Uh, I'll, I'll keep using hypersonic examples because it's the one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, our, our plan right now, the Department of Defense plan, was to have up to 40 flight tests of hypersonic systems in the next four years. Scheduling that on our existing ranges is is really quite a challenge. I, I would imagine. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, that that uh, I don't know if you'll have insight into um, the Secretary of Defense had had mentioned that the 2022 National Defense Strategy is going to be or there will be some significant changes in that compared to the 2018. Um, I didn't know if you have any insight into maybe what some of those changes might be and whether or not they would affect uh, some of the stuff that you talked about in today's speech. So, you know, the, 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 the 2022 um, uh, National Defense Strategy was already ramping up. I mean, we were, we were already working on writing elements of it uh, while I was still in the building. But of course, you know, every new team's gonna put their own focus, their own uh, new, new view onto that document. So the simple answer is, I don't know how it's actually gonna shape out. Um, I would be surprised if you saw significant deviation in the technology list. You might see a shift in focus, um, but you know certainly the things that I that I think we were working on, that I was working on, um, I don't expect to see a significant change because uh, the list that we were working on is kind of the common sense list. Okay. Um, well, one of the questions that uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, from from your end of of the acquisition, you know, kind of timeline uh, and in and, and your perspective. What what have you seen as far as uh, requirements development? Because that get, that gets talked about a lot in in our career field is that a lot of the issues we run into when we're trying to uh, design, build, acquire new weapon systems or capabilities is, uh, we, we you know, we write down a bunch of requirements and then the contractors turn around, they build something for us, and it actually meets all of the requirements, but it's a horrible product. Uh, yeah. And 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 you know, and then that that ends up coming to us, and we end up having to deal with it and tell them that they've got the you know the ugly baby. Um, yeah. But yeah. so I'm curious uh, if you've got any you know advice or insights or where where that tends to fall apart um, as far as you know who's designing those requirements and and uh, and the ways to maybe mitigate that. Well, I uh, yeah, that that also that's 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 an outstanding question. Um, a lot of the problems are caused because of our long acquisition timeline. So one of the reasons that the requirements go awry is that by the time we actually fill the system that we we, we first envisioned. The needs have changed. Um, our best weapon systems have, the, have been the ones that were very that were uh, very adaptable. I mean, look at the B-52 bomber. It was the, the design in the Cold War as a high-altitude, long-range nuclear bomber. Now, now we're using it for for uh, close air support. Um, so, so it was a very flexible system. And I think part of that is, you know, exactly as you allude to, it's it's building the requirements process so that we 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 create flexibility. There's another element to it, which is there's always this balance between requirements uh, pull and technology push. Um, the pendulum tends to swing between those two, those two sides of the coin. And it's important to remember that some of our most important technologies never came out of a requirements document, right? There was never a requirements document for the computer, never a requirements document for nuclear device, never a requirements document for uh, the light bulb for that matter. All right, so there has to be a marriage of technology push and requirements pull to inform the the the, the products that go to the warfighter. And then you know, another element of that is prototyping. I'm a huge fan of prototyping. That is, you build it, you test it, you fly it, you kick the tires, you try it out before you get to the acquisition stage. And and probably the largest piece of our budget in uh, uh, when I was when I was uh, acting deputy undersecretary. Wasn't prototyping for just that reason, trying to play with things before we actually uh, uh, committed to buying them. Sounds uh, sounds fun. Um, uh, 
couple of couple questions popped up. I uh, want to make sure I get to some of these. Uh, there's a student who's curious what uh, for any individuals interested in, interested in contributing to national defense uh, post their their graduation. Um, specifically, this this student's a mechanical engineer. Uh, do you have any specific industries, companies, or recommendations on how he goes about uh, making an impact? Sure. So, so the answer is, look, we we truly have a very diverse s and enterprise in support of the national defense. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. I mean, you can go down the list of, of all the defense industries. Um, um, so many ways to contribute from there. You've got the primes, you've got the, you know, the, the second tier, you, you, you've got the small companies. Um, some of our most innovative ideas come into defense coming from the small companies. Sometimes the mom and pop shops, people working out of their, their garages, their basements, coming up with really clever ideas. We're doing our best to get those ideas into the department. Through various programs, I'm a strong believer in contributing through academia. I mean, the United States Department of Defense uh, funds research across academia. The Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Office of Naval Research in the Navy, the Army Research Officer, Office, uh, Army Research Office, all fund extensive research programs. Um, when 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 we were stepping up in hypersonics, one of the first things we did was step up our investments in academia in hypersonics. Because we, 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 we recognize that's that's an important part. So, you know, for me, a, a faculty member in a department of mechanical engineering, faculty member in a department of aerospace engineering and electrical engineering who's working on issues of, of relevant national defense. That's a very, very important contribution. And, you know, I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I don't know if a university that does it better than Purdue in terms of, of supporting national defense. I mean, you know, from the wind tunnel complexes, Steve Schneider's hypersonic uh, wind tunnel is a national asset. Um, you know, you got a vice president for research, Teresa Meyer is one of our, our thought leaders in microelectronics. Some of the comments that I made about onshore microelectronics, she's, she's one of our na nation's leaders in that. And the list goes on and on. And then finally, of course, there are opportunities within the government. I mean, the Air Force Research Lab, the Naval Research Lab, uh, the Army Research Lab uh, employ incredibly talented individuals all working on, on, on issues of national defense. And then the greater, the, 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 you know, the, the greater DOD and the enterprise. Um, I've got a lot of friends who've worked through the, you know, gone through the flight test center. Um, it's, it's one of our, our foremost engineering centers in the Department of Defense. So, so there really is such a wide range. There's, there's no one avenue that I would, I point out. Um, they, they're all really good. Hey, Josh and Mark, this is Bill. I'm going to interrupt just on a time check. We started a little bit late, and we're getting close to 2:30. So maybe we'll try to wrap up about 2:30. Okay. Maybe one or two more questions. Okay, sounds good. All right, uh, let's see here. I know there was one question up here. Uh, maybe putting you on the spot a little bit, but uh, are, are there opportunities for uh, Purdue to uh, work with the NDIA uh, on, on any of these emerging technologies? Or are they currently? So uh, the answer is absolutely. And uh, and, and your, your Dean of Engineering and I have already been talking about that. So. We, as we're standing up the Emerging Technology Institute, we have a, a, a we're, we've got a really strong focus on partnering with with, with academia. Um, NDIA has been 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 uh, trying to uh, bring on board more and more academic partners. Um, but look, we're, we we are looking for like-minded universities. And here I'll be blunt. All right, there are some universities that are very nervous about working with the Department of Defense. Some some universities that are uncomfortable about it. Uh, there are other universities who who understand the importance, understand how how significant that is to maintain the American way of life, and and we're looking for those universities. And Purdue is 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 really first and foremost on that list. So, uh, um, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> All right. Um, some of these questions are are uh, I think. Fairly specific, maybe more appropriate for a, a, a follow up via email. Sure. Um, I, I guess maybe for a final question, uh, is there any, uh, you know, big picture recommendations that you have uh, for folks that are just about to, to start their career, whether it's, you know, commercial sector or, or, or DOD, um, you know, words of advice uh, that, that you can pass along from uh, from your years of, of experience? Sure. So, so, you know, I'll, 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 I'll tell you. A, a couple of years ago, I was back in my alma mater. I was back at MIT. They'd asked me to talk a little bit about my career. And I, I had that very same question asked of me. 
And and um and, and my answer was, you know, I, I when I look back at my career, I was I was very lucky. I, I just won a bunch of lottery tickets. Right? Opportunities materialized. I, I lucked into them. Uh, first opportunity in the Pentagon was kind of a lottery ticket. I was the right place, at the right time. I got to serve on you know a certain set of committees. I, I, my my career path really changed based on some opportunities. But I, I really thought I, I I won some lottery tickets. I made the mistake of giving that talk to an audience that included my wife, who was also a graduate of the MIT Air Department, and she is usually very quiet, but stood up and said, "No, you got it wrong. You missed one important ingredient." She, by the way, is much smarter than I am. She said, "That is." You always said yes, and that's true, all right? Throughout your career, you will get opportunities, and, and the key is always say yes, all right? I was very active in my professional society, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, right? Whenever they asked me to chair a committee, review papers, be on a panel, I said yes, right? Whenever I was given an opportunity to participate in a study, work with colleagues, I said yes, and then opportunities tended to flow. Now, you know, you'll you'll have opportunities that will never materialize, things you want to do that may not materialize, but you'll find your career going in, in, in different paths. Um, the bottom line also is is be really good at what you do. Um, you know, if, if you, you'll, you'll build your reputation for, for being someone that, that others like to work with, but also someone who, you know, brings value to the table. And I, I think that's that's kind of the, the key to a successful career in technology. I, uh, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, all right, sir, we're, we're past uh, 2.30, so I think that concludes this Q&A session. Uh, right. Once again, thank you. I'm sure maybe Dr. Crosley is going to gonna close, but uh, thank you for letting me chat with you for a little bit. And uh, I'm looking forward. I got about six months left for graduation, so I'm looking forward to get back and uh, start compressing those timelines. Very good. Thanks a lot, Colonel. And hey, hey congratulations. We, 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 we need more. We, we need as many well-educated folks in, 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 our, in our Air Force. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. Have a good day. Yeah, my my thanks to Josh and Mark. I, I have to joke because we can't unmute everybody, so I guess I get to do the applause. <laughs> but Mark, thank you, and thank you, Josh, so much. For everybody who's been listening, I just posted in the chat window a link if you haven't registered for the panel. Uh, Mark is going to sit on a panel with uh, several of our colleagues, Dan Worker, Steve Easter, Jen Neville, and John Paji. They're going to talk about defense-related research and how the universities can do that research and what are some of those important topics the, research, the, the universities can dig into. Sure. That'll be at three o'clock today. And so the, the again, the link is, I posted in the uh, chat box, you can register there and it'll be a, a format very similar to this, a WebEx event. So again, thank you very much, everyone. Mark, I will see you in a little less than half an hour. All right, thank you so much, really appreciate it. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye.